Well, this morning we've got a busy, busy day of baptisms prayerfully and uh, going to spend some time in the scriptures. So you guys can grab your Bibles out. If you're new or visiting, you're not used to how we normally do it here at Riverview. We, we love studying the Word of God. And uh, God's Word is not just something that was written a couple thousand years ago that has no bearing on our life today. On the contrary, God's Word is so practical and so powerful for our lives here today. Amen? Amen. Have you found that to be true? And so we study God's Word. We look at it and we let God correct us and convict us. And this morning we're going to be in a passage of Scripture from the book of Romans. So if you've got your Bible out, open up to Romans. We're going to be in chapter 6 this morning. And it might catch some of you off guard because you're thinking, hey, isn't this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we should be studying in the Gospels and the story of, of Jesus going that this morning. We will be talking about the resurrection of Jesus, but the Lord led me to a different passage and a little bit different angle this morning for, for Resurrection Sunday. We know that Jesus was crucified on a cross. We celebrated that this week. We remembered that, and I say celebrate, and that might sound weird, right? We celebrated that Jesus died, Amen. but it's a good thing that Jesus died. Amen? Amen? If Jesus did not die on the cross for our sins, then we would be without hope. We'd be without forgiveness. But equally, if Jesus died on the cross and just remained dead, we would be equally lost and hopeless. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, you see, Jesus foretold that he was going to do so. He said, I'm going to die. Uh, my life isn't taken from me, but I'm laying it down willingly. And when Jesus went to the cross and he died, he didn't stay dead. He did exactly as he said, and he rose from the grave, proving that he was not just a man, he was not a martyr, but he was the Messiah. And he is God incarnate in human flesh who had come for us. He came for us to forgive our sin, yes, to pay the penalty of our sin, which the Bible says the wages of our sin, the penalty of our sin is what, church? Death. Our sin deserves death. Jesus said, I don't want you all to have to die. I don't want you all to have to be punished and separated from me, God would say, because of your sin. So he came and took our place and died for us on that cross. But then he rose again from the dead. Because Jesus, his desire for you and me, God's desire for us more than anything is not only that we'd be forgiven, but that we might experience what he accomplished. What's that? Resurrection life. Resurrection from death to life. Jesus did this for us. And what I want to talk about today is something that I think a lot of Christians stop short of. You see, a lot of people will hear the gospel that Jesus died for their sins and rose again so that they could go to heaven. And they put their faith in that and they believe that with all their heart, but then they stop there. They receive Christ for their salvation, but then they stop. They sit. They don't go any further. And Jesus came, yes, to forgive our sin, to save us from the penalty of our sin eternally, but furthermore, Jesus came, church, to save us and deliver us from the power of sin in our lives presently. Amen? So check this out. He saved us from the, in the past, he saved us from the penalty of the, the eternal penalty of our sin, but he's also saved us from the present power of sin in our lives. The Bible, furthermore, says that one day we will be saved, future tense, we will be saved from the very presence of sin altogether. This is the threefold past, present, future deliverance from sin. And guys, sin is that which separates us from God. Sin is 
that which the Bible says brought death and evil and pain into this world. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to be completely free from sin. Amen? Amen. And one day, the Bible says, we will be completely freed from even the presence of sin. But right now, do we realize, do we understand, do we live with the knowledge that he has set us free from the power of sin? He set us free from the power of sin in our lives. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 6 together this morning. Let's read Romans 6 verses 1 through 3 together. The Apostle Paul writes here, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be, Paul says. Immediately before this, in the end of chapter 5, Paul made this statement. He said that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. He's talking about this truth that although we sin, and our sin is great, that God's grace is greater than our sin. Hallelujah. Isn't that a good thing? That where our sin increased, though the evil of mankind was abounding and abundant, and we look around our world today, and is there a lot of evil in this world? Yeah, you don't have to look far. Turn on the news. Turn on a commercial. You'll see evil in commercials. Look at a billboard. Look across the street. Look in the mirror. You'll see evil in this world. You'll see the wickedness, the sin of mankind has increased. But where sin increased, Paul says, grace abounded all the more. What does this mean? This means for us. This says to us that no matter how great your sin is, God's grace to cover your sin is greater. This is so important because so many people think, oh man, I don't think there's any hope for me. I'm such a wicked person. I've blown it so big. My sin is so awful and terrible, I don't think God could ever love me wrong. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, Paul says. Now, Paul Paul is following up that. Paul is following up that statement that's so powerful and important that God's grace is great with this anticipated perverse uh, application of the grace of God. And that is that some would say, well, great. If God's grace covers all my sin, then we can just keep on living in sin. This is an argument that some people would take from that. Great. If my sin increases, God's grace increases even more and covers that sin. I'm just going to keep sinning. Why not? And Paul says his answer to that in verse 2 is, may it never be that someone, that any of us would use that line of thinking. But how often? How often have we done this? How often have we justified sin in our lives? Or allowed sin to remain? Or been complacent in our attitude towards our sin? Think, well, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, because God covers it. Remember what it took for God to cover that sin and provide grace for your sin. What did he have to do? Was it not that big of a deal? Let's remember that he had to suffer and die on a cross. His hands and his feet were pierced. He was whipped in his back, 39 lashes. In the most horrific and excruciating pain he had to endure in order to provide that grace for you and me. So may it never be, Paul says, that we would use the grace of God in that way, which actually is an abuse of the grace of God. And I mentioned this last week in my teaching. It's just something the Lord's been bouncing around my head and my heart. But the grace of God, it's not to be abused. That's what Paul's saying here. But it's also not to be refused. This is, we're so extreme. We're so black and white as human beings. We see one thing that could be dangerous, so we oftentimes swing the pendulum to another side that is equally dangerous. 
Yes, it could be dangerous to preach, hey, grace covers your sin. People could abuse that. But then what we can do is refuse the grace of God and say, well, God's grace doesn't cover you if you live in sin. Well, that's not true either. What we are meant to do is to use the grace of God. Don't abuse it. Don't refuse it. Use the grace of God. Enjoy and embrace the grace of God, but take your sin as serious as he did when he died on the cross for it. So Paul says, may it never be that we would abuse the grace of God is what he's saying. End of verse 2. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul makes the statement that we have died to sin. Verse 3. Or do you not know? Do you, do you not know that you've died to sin, Paul says, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We've got a pool of water up here. Prayerfully, God's going to draw some of you even today to be baptized in this water. Paul is saying, remember when you got baptized? What that pictured, what that was that was being symbolically Shown as you were buried in the water of baptism, you were symbolically buried with Christ, just like Jesus died for our sin. He was buried for our sin. When we get baptized, we are saying, I am dead to sin. Just like Christ died for my sin, we have died to sin as well. Sin has been put to death on our behalf. Amen? good news. And Paul says, do you not know this? I think there's a lot of Christians that don't realize this. That Jesus died for our sin, but also you and I are, have died to sin. We're dead to sin, is what Paul's saying here. We died to sin. That's what baptism pictures, being buried in the water. You know, spoiler alert, but you come back out, out of the water during baptism we bury you in there, complete immersion in the water, picturing death. But then you're brought back up out of that water, and that's pictured uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we died to sin, Paul says. The question I believe maybe is, is for us, is sin dead to you? We died to sin when we were baptized in, into Christ, pictured through physical water baptism, but literally, when you give your life to Christ, the Bible says it like this, that you are placed into Christ, like you are absorbed into him, you are covered by him, you're robed with him, completely surrounded, immersed. That's what the word baptism means, to be immersed. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you put your faith in him, you are now absorbed into him. You're immersed into Christ. And what he did for us has also been done for you. It's been done in you very real, uh, pra practically and literally. Jesus died for sin. You are now dead to sin. But is sin dead to you? Do you view yourself as being dead to sin? Or are you still trying to live in sin? You see, for the Christian, this is never going to work. For the non-Christian, it's not going to work either. Right? Isn't that why we came to Christ? Because we were living a life of sin. We were all sinners doing whatever we wanted, and it wasn't working out. Because the wages of sin is death. It'll never please. It'll never fulfill and gratify. So we came to the one who promised us new life, and freedom from sin. Again, not only the eternal penalty of sin, but here Paul's going to talk about set us free from the present power of sin in our lives. Meaning what? Meaning through what Jesus accomplished, through his death for our sin, the power of sin has been broken over you and me who are in Christ. We do not have to sin anymore, is what Paul's going to talk about here. We don't have to live in sin. Although sin keeps trying to live in us, anyone can relate to that? I sure can. Ask my wife. She'll tell you, oh yeah, sin lives in my husband still. 
It, he's died to sin, but sometimes he's, that sin tries to still live in him, still tries to come through him. It's like this tree that we saw. My wife and I were loading up some firewood uh, yesterday and on this burn pile, big old burn pile that I've, I've created at my house that should probably light off soon because it's nice out. Uh, this burn pile, there's this massive old apple tree that was just dead and rotting and parts were falling off it. So I ripped this thing out with an excavator and put it on a pile, burn pile. It's ready to get torched. Well, I've been procrastinating. Anyone else do that sometimes? And I haven't lit off the pile yet. So here it is. It's springtime. And guess what that tree's doing? It's budding. It's blooming. On the, it's been on the pile for three months. Out of the ground. It's not in the dirt anymore. It's just sitting on the top of this pile. And it's budding and blooming all over. It's trying to stay alive. But what? But it's dead. It's already had its sentence given to it. It's been uprooted and ripped out, and it's ready to be burned. But why is that tree still trying to bud and bloom? What have I not done yet? I haven't burned it up. I need to get some, uh, some ground-up tire, right? That stuff works good. Mix it with some diesel. Oh, sorry. Are there any greenies in here? Take some... I don't know. You burn it. I need to burn the pile, however that needs to be accomplished. And as I burn that tree, then guess what? It's not going to be able to bloom and bud any longer. And right now, I'm just curious, what if it even brings forth fruit? What if that tree even brings forth some apples this, this year? I'm just curious to see. I'm going to burn it before then. Don't worry. But... <laughs> That fruit that it's going to try and bring out, it's, it's bound for death. That fruit isn't going to, even if it puts out a little fruit, it's not going to last very long on that tree, is it? Because why? Because it's already been put to death. It's already been cut out of the ground. And same with our sin. Our sin has been uprooted. It's the power. It's been ripped out by the death of Jesus Christ, but our sin in us, it's still going to try and stay alive and produce fruit in our lives. But we're going to look at what kind of fruit that is. So I need to burn that tree. Similarly, what do we need to do with things of the sin nature, things, sinful things in our life, sinful tendencies? We need to burn it. Man, we need to get rid of it. There might be stuff in your life. And this is this is for the, the, the Christian primarily. Understand this. If you're in here and you're like, I don't know Jesus yet. You're telling me I need to burn up stuff in my life. You need to come to Jesus. First, first you need to come to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner and you're a savior. Would you save me and forgive me of my sin? Guess what? He will. And with his salvation, his forgiveness of your sin, he has provided freedom from sin. And he will begin then to start this process in you by which he is trying to get you to remove sin from your life. Cast it off. Put it away. And so when I say burn up the sin in your life, I'm talking to the Christian. What good does it do for someone who doesn't have salvation? forgiveness of sins. What good does it do for a person to clean up their life and try to rid themselves of sin when A, they don't have the power to do so because they haven't been baptized into Christ, put their faith into Christ. So they don't have the power to get rid of sin in their own life. But secondarily, even if they were able to clean up their lives and fix their bad habits and, and make their life more pleasant, what good is that if they're eternally lost and not bound to spend eternity forgiven in the presence of God in heaven. See, the Bible is very clear. There's two destinations. You go to be eternally with God in heaven or you go to be separated from God. We refer to that as hell, being separate from God. God doesn't want that for anyone. That's why he came. That's why he became the man Jesus. That's why he died for us. That's why he suffered. That's why he rose again. But it's no good trying to clean up your life if you don't first come to know Jesus. And so you got to start there. But for us, 
We've got to burn up that stuff. Paul says this over in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. He tells us to make no provision for the flesh. Don't allow your flesh to... But many of us, like the apple tree on my burn pile, I've made provision for it. Even though its death sentence has been given... I'm procrastinating and completely and entirely eliminating that tree. I'm making provision for it to remain and continue to exist in our lives. What things, what areas are you procrastinating in, putting off, dealing with something, cutting something out, burning something up that is plaguing your life, that's bringing death, that's just full of rottenness? What in your life could that be? Paul goes on in verse 4. I want you to consider that. Let that be mulling around in your mind, in your heart. Verse 4, Paul says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What's Paul saying? Not only through entering into Jesus Christ by faith and being baptized, that pictures us identifying with his death, so the power of sin is broken over, sin is put to death, but also as he resurrected from the dead, we identify with his resurrection. That God wants us to live a new life. God wants us to live a resurrected life. Not the same life that we used to live. But there's a new life he wants us to live through his power. So get this. Don't miss this. Don't just say, well, I got saved. Isn't that what it's all about? Oh, that is so important. Yes, absolutely. You want to be saved and have your sin forgiven. But have you been set free from the bondage of your sin, from the power of your, the sin in your life? H- have you practically seen your life transformed on a real practical level? Because God has made that possible, provided that to us. Over in Galatians, Paul talks about the difference between the old life and this newness of life that Paul says we can walk in. Walking in this newness of life. Galatians chapter 5, I want to read to you this kind of comparison of living the old life or walking in newness of life that God has provided for us. In verse 18 of Galatians 5, Paul writes over there, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Here he's going to talk about the old life. This pretty well describes a life without Christ. You may relate to this. Think of how you were living before you knew Jesus. Paul says all of these things of the flesh are immorality, Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife and jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, which is like partying, and things like these, Paul says, of which I forewarn you, Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who are living a life full of those things are not those who are the redeemed. But for those of us who are redeemed, this sin nature still exists inside of us. Although it's been put to death through the death of Christ. Amen? You tracking with me? It's on that burn pile. It's still trying to bud. It's still trying to blossom. It's still trying to bring forth fruit in our lives. But it's bad fruit. Like that list of things Paul just read off in Galatians 5. It's full of enmity and strife and jealousy and anger and sensuality. This lust and immorality and 
all sorts of problems and things that we used to live like, the old life, but that's not how we are called to live any longer. And if you're a Christian and you're still living in all of those things, Jesus wants to set you free. And he wants you to experience this newness of life and be the resurrected life that Christ has made available to us. And these are the fruits. These are the outworkings that will come into our life, Paul says, when we're not walking in the flesh, the old life, but we're walking by the power of the Spirit of God. And that's the only way, by the way, that we can walk out this new life. It's not something that we do in and of ourselves, amen? We don't just say, all right, I'm making a decision today. I'm going to stop being a sinner, and I'm going to choose from now on. I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to walk a new life just like Jesus. You can't do that on your own. You can do nothing on your own. Jesus said that. He said, without me, you can do nothing. We can screw a lot of stuff up on our own. But we can't do anything good. We surely can't live this new life on our own. This is where daily, for the Christian, in our lives, guys, daily we have to rely on his power. We have to ask him to fill us with his spirit, with his word, with the tools. We have to communicate with the Lord throughout the day when we're tempted, when we're struggling, when we're down. And that power that we receive from the Lord is what enables us to walk out this new life. And Paul says, this is what will be in your life. Life, if you are walking out the spirit-filled life, if you're living that resurrected life and walking in newness, Galatians 5.22, he says, the fruit of the spirit, the, the outworkings that will come from walking in that new life in the spirit rather than the old life, the flesh, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Paul says these are the things that will be filling your life if you are understanding and knowing that sin is dead to you. I'm, I've died to sin and sin is dead to me and I don't have to live in it anymore. I don't have to allow it to have power over me anymore. And this is what, back to Romans chapter 6, what Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, let's read that together. Paul says, knowing this, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Paul is picturing who we are apart from Christ. You see, before you meet Jesus, all you have is the natural man, full of its lusts and desires, and a nature that wants to sin. A nature that does what you think is best, usually what's best for you, living very selfishly, living in your own wisdom. That's the life apart from Christ that Paul's talking about here. And he pictures that life as this body, as this old man, if you will. He refers to it as the old self. But Paul says the old self, that old man, who we were, is now dead. Who we were before coming to Jesus, that old guy was crucified with Jesus. Jesus died on the cross, but it was in place of us our old man. Now, he has a new life for us to live. Amen. But it starts with knowing this. Amen. This is what Paul says here in verse 6. Knowing this, that word knowing means to perceive, to come to know, to realize. Do we realize that the old self is dead? Do we realize, do we know, do we perceive, do we understand that our body of sin has been done away with. Now that word done away with in the Greek language, which was the original language that the New Testament was written in, that Paul the Apostle was writing this in, in Greek. The Greek word there for to be done away with is the Greek word katargeo. Can you guys say that? K 
katargeo. We're learning Greek on Easter morning. Katargeo, this Greek word, means to make idle or inactive. To be loosed from is another translation for that word. So something that is made idle or inactive, to be loosed from something, mean it no longer has a grip on you. Furthermore, it can mean to paralyze. This word katargeo. And it's used of what? The old self. The old life. The, the old me who was bound and restricted by a desire and a will to sin and please self. Paul says, that's been done away. That's been made idle or inactive. It's been paralyzed. You've been loosed from that. But again, for many people who have been saved, their old man is very much still active in their life, alive, having a grip on them. But I want to point this out. It doesn't have a grip on you because it has power in and of itself. Jesus broke that power is what Paul is very clearly declaring here. Jesus broke that power, so if something has a grip on you, it's not a power coming from it. It's a power you are giving to it. So if you're a Christian here this morning, you've been making excuses, and we, we say, oh, I just can't. I just can't overcome the sin in my life. I just can't stop doing the other thing. Yes, you can. How do I know? Because Paul says it right here. Sin doesn't have a grip on us. We don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. The power of sin has been broken. You guys understand what they do with like elephants when they're babies, you know, circus elephants and these animals that they're going to use for human entertainment and all of that. When they're babies, elephants are extremely powerful animals, not something to mess with. If you come upon an elephant out in the safari in the wild, you better watch out, right? That thing can kill you. Now, elephants are so powerful. What they do is when they're young, when they're just a baby, those elephants, they tie a rope around it and put a stake in the ground. When they're babies, we understand those elephants, they're bound by that little stake. But as they grow and as they mature in, in this analogy, when we come to grow and we, we become into Christ, we, what I mean by that, when we come into Christ by faith, we are no longer this baby elephant. We have been given power by Jesus Christ. And you understand that baby elephant as it grows. It learns early on that this stake in the ground, oh, I'm just not strong enough. Why? I'm a little baby elephant. I can't pull the stake out of the ground. This rope is binding me. But as the elephant grows, it just learns to stop trying. I, I've tried so many times to pull away, and it, I can't overcome it. So what do they do? The elephant stops trying to pull on that stake. And even as the elephant grows and is this ginormous, powerful animal that couldn't be held down by 20 stakes... <laughs> The giant adult elephant will stay put, stay in place, stay bound by a little rope and a stake in the ground. Why? Because it's learned, to, it's come to believe and think that it can't overcome the power of that little stake and that rope. But it can so easily. But it's a matter of the mind. It's a matter of what you believe. It's a, a matter of what you have come to know and, and understand. And I want to ask you, I want to ask us, challenge us this morning, what are we believing when it comes to our sin? Do you believe and know that just as God raised Jesus from the dead and he overcame death and sin, so too that same power has been made available toward us. That we don't have to be slaves to that little stake and rope in the ground like that baby elephant that it's been made inactive it's been done away with it's been put to death paul uses this analogy that the old man he's, he's like a body and that old man it has been put to death does someone who's dead have any longer power or authority over another person 
No, they're dead. They're gone. Many people maybe have experienced someone who hurt them or, or something like that. But if that person dies, they can't hurt you anymore. You might say, well, I'm still hurting a lot from someone who's dead. But why? They're, they're de- dead. They can't hurt you anymore. Many people, many of us continue to allow things to hurt us, to enslave us, to destroy us that have long been gone and dead and have no real power over us other than the power that we are giving to them in our thinking, in our mind, in our belief. Maybe you've been held captive by someone who harmed you. You've got to come to understand. You've got to break that power in your thinking of that person over you. And similarly, when it comes to our sin, church, we've got to come to know that he has set us free. What tremendous power this brings to us as Christians. You've been given power by God through your standing in Christ because of his death, you're dead to sin. But because of his resurrection, you've been given new life to live. But we have to perceive this. Verse 6. We have to know this. We have to understand this truth so as not to be under the power of sin any longer. That's step number one. If you're taking notes this morning or you're taking mental notes, point number one is you got to know that the power is broken. Point number two, when it comes to this, you have got to take action against. You've got to take action against and deal with the area of defeat in your flesh, in your sin. Number three, you've got to walk in the light. I might reverse those two, actually, now that I come to think of it. Number one, you've got to know the power's broken. Number two, you've got to walk in the light. You've got to walk in the things that are true. You've got to be in the word and in fellowship with God and with his people. You've got to be praying for strength from the Lord, allowing him and asking him to fill you with the power of his Holy Spirit. And then number three, you've got to take action against your flesh, that area of sin and bondage in your life. The thing that's enslaving you, that's keeping you captive, it could be a lack of forgiveness. Did you know that a lack of forgiveness is sin? Well, I'm not, I, can, I can't ever forgive that person for what they did. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, neither will I forgive you. Whoa. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll think about forgiving that person. After all, now, now that you say that, Jesus, Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, neither will I forgive you. Why is that? I believe when we don't forgive others, it reveals a complete lack, a total lack of understanding the grace of God. And someone who says, oh, okay, God, I want you to forgive me, but I'm not forgiving anyone else, hasn't really truly come to know and experience the full grace of God that forgives all of our sin but also has provided forgiveness for everyone else's sin. You see, we want God's forgiveness for us. But sometimes we don't want God's forgiveness for other people. Other people have hurt us. But such is the grace of God. It's not limited to who you and I would like to see forgiven. But Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. So that anyone can be saved. So we've got to do those things. We've got to know power. the power of sin is broken. We've got to walk in the light and submit to the Lord. And we've got to resist the devil. Or we've got to take action against those areas of sin in our life. We have to forgive people. We have to remove sin. We have to remove substances. We've got to keep things from not creeping back into our life. You ever find that to be true even as a Christian? You put things away years ago. And you thought you were done with them. They were dead and gone. And now here you, whoa, where did that come from? That's trying to creep back in. Like that budding apple tree that was on the pot, burn pile. Why? Because you haven't destroyed it. You haven't burnt it up. Light that fire. And what I find, guys, is when I am on fire for the Lord, when his fire is burning inside of me, 
those things of evil, they just aren't able to creep in like they otherwise would. Sin and evil and darkness, it doesn't dwell in the light. It dwells in darkness. So when we are filling up with light, what does fire produce, by the way? Light is one of the things that fire produces. When we're full of the fire of God, his light expels the darkness. Stop letting sin rule over you, is my encouragement today. Verse 8 of Romans 6, we're getting close to done here. Verse 8 of Romans 6, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's our future. If we die with Christ, we are also going to live with him one day. When we leave this life, when we die in this physical body, the Bible says that our spirit will go to be with him. One day we will receive new bodies, heavenly bodies, not bodies that fall apart and perish and have pains and aches. You with me? Anybody want one of those? Oh, yeah, I want one of those bodies, upgraded body that doesn't hurt anymore. We will, for those of us who are in Christ, we will be with him. We will have fullness of joy in heaven. There'll be no more sin, no more pain, no more death. So if we've died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing, verse 9, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you don't have that mindset, if we don't have that mindset that I've been saved and forgiven, yes, but now I'm dead to sin. The Christian life is our destiny, our calling, our purpose is not to continue in sin, is to be set free from sin and not please ourselves any longer, but experience the life, that resurrection life, the newness of life that God has made available to us, that he died and rose again to make possible for us. Therefore, verse 12 do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body as, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. As I said, we need to stop letting sin rule over us. It's not our master anymore. Amen. Well, then why do I keep doing it? Because a number of things. You don't believe that the power has been broken over you from sin, from, sin, from Satan. You don't believe that you can overcome that through the power that Christ has made, been made, uh, made available to you. Or you, maybe you believe that, but you're not doing the things like walking in the light, being in the word, and in fellowship, and surrounding yourself with the things that God says will cause us to walk in his spirit instead of walking in the flesh. Or maybe you're doing those things. I'm walking in the spirit. I'm coming to church. I'm in fellowship. I'm going to home group. I pray. But man, I'm still struggling with sin. Have you removed those things from your life? Have you cut out the, the poison? Have you cut out the, the problem? Or are there things that are still remaining that are bringing death into your life, into your daily living, that are creating bondage and, and suffering. Paul says, stop using your body for sin and present your body to the Lord. This, guys, this is the true understanding of what grace is. Amen. This is the grace of God. Not grace to keep on sinning, but grace to live a life that's free from the power of sin. Amen. That's what grace is really all about. Glory. We're free from the grip of grace. Paul says over in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. This means if you are coming to Christ by faith, you have been made new. You're a new creation. Amen. You're not what you used to be. 
You don't have to do the things you used to do. You're not to live the way you used to live. You're a new creature. The old things have passed away. Like Paul says here, the old self has passed away, has died, has been crucified with Christ. And Paul says there, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Behold, new things have come. Do you realize that today? Do you perceive that today? Have you come to know that today that there's resurrection power in a new life of freedom, of fullness, of not the same old sin, the same old death, the same old results and brokenness in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your joy. There's no joy in your life. There's just hurt and hopelessness. That's not what Jesus meant for us to live, a life full of those things. That's the old life. That's the flesh. We don't have to live that way anymore. Jesus came to transform us, to change our life into something totally new. And if you've you've become a Christian, you say, well, I'm a Christian, but have you been transformed through coming to know that he set you free, not just from the eternal penalty of your sin, but from presently in your life, the power of sin over you. Don't miss out on the full gospel that Jesus came to give to us. Life eternal, but here and now, life more abundant. And I think there's a lot of Christians, a lot of people, oh, I'll take life eternal, I'll take eternal life. But their life here and now is full of brokenness and hurt, bad choices, sin, bondage to their old life and their old ways and their old things. Old things are dead. Put it away. Burn it up. Step into the light. Walk with Jesus. Know that he's given you power over that. And don't use that excuse any longer. Why? Again, the end of this chapter, verse 23, tells us the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you have not come to know that for yourself, I want to invite you today, for those who are Christians, for those of us who've already received Christ, but you've been in some area of your life in bondage to your sin and making excuses like, I'm too weak. I just, I can't overcome it. Uh, sin, temptation is just too strong. Wrong. Wrong. The Bible says there's no temptation that takes you, that comes to you, but such as is common to man. I Meaning we're all faced with the same sort of temptation. It might look a little bit different, but no one's tempted more than somebody else. It's common to man. And with every temptation, the Bible tells us that God provides a way out, a way of escape question is do you understand there's a way out well now you do are you going to take that way out well that's up to you or are you going to stay if this building was on fire we've got lots of exits all over the place are you going to take an exit or are you just going to stay there in the flames being consumed and destroyed instead of leaving, stepping out into the light and being set free. So as we close in prayer, as our heads are bowed and we're praying, I just want to, I want to ask this morning to those who are saved already, those of us that are Christians, do you resonate with that teaching this morning? For those of us that are Christians that have already put our faith in Jesus, but the enemy's just had his grip and his way in our lives. And we've been living not a life of victory, but of perpetual defeat, it feels like. That is not God's purpose for you. That's not God's calling 
for your life. He wants you to be set free. The Bible says, whom the Son is set free, he is free indeed. You got to know that. You got to want it. And I want to ask you today, any Christian in here who you've been allowing sin to rule over you, not because it has power over you, but because you've given power to it through lack of knowledge, perhaps, through discouragement of trying to be set free in the past and never being able to, well, now you know you've been given power through Christ Jesus. Anyone just want to say, Lord, I want to walk in newness of life. I've been saved. (laughs) I've given my life to Christ, but I've been walking in defeat. Is there anyone here this morning, Christians, that you say, that's me. Would you put your hand up to the Lord and say, Lord, I I want a new found freedom in my life. You know what you're thinking about. You know the exact area that you've struggled with, that you've been in bondage to, and you say, Lord, I want freedom. God, I I don't want to wrestle with this perpetually, constantly falling down and failing in this area of my life. And you're saying today, Lord, I believe that you set me free. Keep those hands up to the Lord and just say, maybe even lift both your hands. Just an act of surrender. Lord, I just pray you'd bring deliverance and freedom to these right now who've got their hands up. Lord, I pray that you'd bring resurrection life. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. And Lord, to cast away sin, make no provision for our flesh, to burn up those things, Lord, that are trying to still live inside of us but have been sentenced to death, Lord. Bring newfound freedom, Lord. May we walk in the freedom, Christ, that you provided for us. I pray that today over these, Lord. By the power of your Holy Spirit, God, bring freedom, bring life. Help us to believe what is true. And those thoughts of doubt and and captivity to the enemy, Lord, may we take those thoughts captive to the obedience of what you say in your word. You've set us free. You guys can put your hands down. If you're in here today and you've not given your life to Christ, I want to invite you to do that today. If you've not called upon Jesus to say, Jesus, I, I've, I, I need forgiveness of sin. The Bible says to confess Jesus is Lord. The Bible says to confess that he is Lord, that you believe that Jesus is God, that he's the Savior, that he died on the cross for your sin. If you believe that, You believe that, as we're celebrating today, God raised him from the dead three days later. And you want to say, I believe that. I believe in you, Jesus. And I want you to forgive my sin. Would you put your hand up today and just say, I want to receive Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior. If you've never done that before, and you're here today, and you've been walking in brokenness, you've been walking in darkness, and you just say, Man, I, I want that life. I want a new life. I want eternal life. Anyone in here wants to just say, yeah, I want Jesus to come in, into my life here today. Would you put your hand up to the Lord and say, Lord, this is me. Just responding to that invitation.